Hi, this is Dan Heisman, and we're continuing with our series of YouTube videos to help you improve your chess play. One of the things I hear occasionally from my students is, oh, I was playing the opening, and then my opponent played a move that I didn't know, and I got all panicked, and I played real fast, and I messed up, and I lost right in the opening. So I thought I'd make a video on how to handle what happens when your opponent makes a new move in the opening. The first thing I want to say about this is it shouldn't be a surprise if you're any kind of reasonable player and you're playing someone who's of any level, you're going to get taken out of your opening at some point in almost every single game that you play, almost 100%. The only time I'm not taken out of my opening book is if my opponent falls into a trap that's an opening trap that I know, and I and he resigns, then he never played a no move. The whole game was book. It was a book loss. But if it's not a book loss, if they play an opening that doesn't lose immediately and, and someone doesn't resign, that at some point we're going to get out of our opening preparation. No matter whether I know three moves or six or 12 or 20, at some point there's going to be a move where I go, okay, well, that's as far as I studied. That's all I know. And whether my opponent's playing a move that's not in the book or he's playing a move that is in the book, but I just haven't studied that much of the book yet, it really doesn't matter. He's playing a move that I don't know, and at that point I just have to start thinking like it's not part of my book knowledge anymore. So because it happens almost every single game, you can't be surprised, you can't panic. It's going to happen every game. So if it's going to happen every game, get used to it. It's the normal thing that's going to happen. You're going to be in your book modes for a while, and then you're going to be out of your book modes, and that's the way it goes. So when your opponent makes that move that takes you out of the book, don't panic. Put on the brakes. Say, okay, you know, let's figure out what I want to do. By the way, one of the common mistakes I see is people study a certain pattern, and then when the opponent plays a different move, they play the same moves of the pattern as if their opponent continued to do that. I guess the most famous example is the grandmaster who taught the beginner about the Roy Lopez. So the grandmaster taught the, be taught the beginner, you know, play e4, and after e5, play knight f3, and after knight c6, play bishop to b5. That's called the Roy Lopez. And if your opponent plays a6, then the main move I want you to play is bishop to a4, and so on. So the beginner goes to a tournament, and he plays the move the grandmaster taught him, e4, and his opponent plays c5, and he looks at that move and he says, oh, well, I guess uh, I can still play my Roy Lopez. So he plays knight f3, and black plays knight c6, and white says, okay, all according to plan, bishop to b5. And black plays a6, and the beginner says, okay, well, the grandmaster told me to play bishop a4. And black says, hmm, that doesn't look very good. b5, bishop b3, c4, and we have that Noah's Ark pattern trapping the bishop. And the beginner loses his bishop. So the beginner goes back to the grandmaster, and he says, that Roy Lopez you taught me isn't very good. And the grandmaster says, what are you talking about? He says, well, I played it and I lost my bishop right away. And the grandmaster says, well, show me. So the beginner says, all right, my game started e4, c5. And the grandmaster says, well, wait a minute. He said, this is a Sicilian. This isn't a Roy Lopez. I didn't show you how to play against the Sicilian. I just showed you the Roy Lopez. And the beginner says, well, I figured I could still play the Roy Lopez, even if he did that. So I played knight f3. And he played knight c6, and I played bishop b5, and the grandmaster goes, uh-oh. And the beginner says, yeah, and he played a6 just like you said. And the, and the grandmaster says, well, this is the Sicilian, not the Roy Lopez. He doesn't have a pawn on e5. He has a pawn on c5. And when people play a6, you're supposed to take the knight. And the beginner says, yeah, but you told me to play bishop a4. And the grandmaster says, yes, but not in this position. I told you to play it in the position where black has a pawn on e5, not a pawn on c5. In this position, bishop a4 loses the bishop to b5, bishop b3, c4, and you get your bishop trapped. 
And the Boehner says, yeah, I know, so the Roy Lopez is no good. And the Grand Master says, but this is not the Roy Lopez. You can't make the same moves like Bishop A4 that you can in the Roy Lopez if he had a pawn on E5. Bishop A4 is a very good move if the black pawn's on E5. If the black pawn's on C5, it's a giant blunder. So the beginner made the mistake of thinking, well, if my opponent plays a move I don't know, in this case E4, C5, that... I'll just play the most that I know anyway. Well, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Sometimes if you do, you can get away with it. Sometimes if you do, like in this case, it's a disaster. But you don't want to just play the same moves you always play. I'll give you another example of this. I had a student of mine who studied the O'Kelly variation. So the O'Kelly variation of the Sicilian is E4, C5, Knight F3, A6. It's a pretty rare line, and the idea is that if white plays d4 after pawn takes, knight takes, knight f6, um, knight c3, you can play e5, and white can't play knight to b5. But what black can, white can do against the O'Kelly is he can play a good form of like the c3 Sicilian, or even play it like a Maroxy bind with c4 and, and d4. So I had a student who was playing the O'Kelly and white played knight c3. Now against knight c3, the main move is to play knight to c6. You could also play e6. Those are the two main lines. But he played a6. And I said, well, why did you play a6? And he said, well, I'm playing the O'Kelly. And I said, no, the O'Kelly's against knight f3. Against knight c3, a6 is not the O'Kelly. It might transpose, but it probably won't. And a6 doesn't make a lot of sense against knight c3. It's not a terrible move. But you don't just keep playing the same moves just because you study them in a different move order. So same kind of error that beginner made in the Grandmaster Oak thing. So let's take a game that uh, one of my students played years ago here. And let's see what happens when one of the players gets taken out of the book. All right, so white plays e4. Black plays e6. White plays d4. Black plays d5, main line of the French. And now the four main moves for white are exchange variation, advance variation, classical, which is the most common, and tarish. So white plays the advance variation. Now I tell my students the advance variation is perfectly good for white. Grandmasters play it. But it's also easy to misplay for white. Please don't play the advance variation unless you study it because it's very, very easy for black to get an advantage against the advance variation if white do doesn't know what he's doing, much more so than against a lot of other openings. So don't play the advance variation unless you know what you're doing, unless you've studied the book. And that's a very important comment because a lot of people see the French defense and think, well, that, that's refuted by E5 because I have more space in the center. And it's true, white does have more space in the center, but it, it's not necessarily, quote, the natural move, and it's not necessarily that easy to play. So here, this is the pointing rule we talked about in earlier videos. Black's pawns are pointing queenside, white's pawns are pointing kingside. The only time you can apply the pointing rule is if all four center pawns are locked together. If they're not locked together, for instance, if you have a position like this, as I mentioned in the other video, you can't use the pointing rule here. The pawns are not locked together. But when they're all locked together, as in this game, now you can point. White should go king side. His break move will probably be f5. Black will go queen side. His break move is c5. And the book move here is to play the break move instantly, which black did. And now white's supposed to continue guard his d pawn with a pawn so he can take back with a pawn and keep his center. Black continues to pressure the d pawn. White develops the king side and guards the d pawn at the same time. Black continues to pressure the pawn. Now suppose you're black here and you studied this opening and you said, gee, the book has three moves here for white. It has the main line bishop e2. It has the modern line a3. And it has the Milner Barry Gambit Bishop D3. So I study all three of those. And now White plays Queen C2. Now notice if we look at the clocks, Black's used a little bit of his time in the 45-45 game, but White's been playing all these moves instantly up to now. But now White's out of his book, and he takes four minutes and he plays Queen.
queen to c2. So if you're black, should you sit here and panic and say, oh my goodness, I studied bishop e2, bishop d3, and a3. I didn't study queen c2. I'm in big trouble. What am I going to do? He's made a move. I don't know what to do. What am I going to do? Well, no, of course not. So the first thing you have to ask yourself is, if it's not a book move, it could be a terrible blunder. It could be a reasonable move, but it doesn't give white any advantage. Uh, there's lots of things it's possible. You don't know until you analyze the position. So very often, you're, if your opponent's white and he plays an innocuous move, let's say white plays, you know, h3. Well, that move is basically just losing a tempo, so it's, it's not going to be in the book, but it's not like losing a piece or something. It's just that black can continue developing normally here, and white's last move just doesn't really do anything, so it's going to be out of your book, but it's not going to cause you any great problems, but on the other hand, you're not going to, quote, refute it. So let's look at that move, queen c2. All right, so what should black do? Well, if, if you read, sorry, if you, if you watched my video earlier called the safety table, the safety table tells you how many times everything's attacked and guarded among squares that are attacked by opposing pieces. And queen c2 affects the safety table by removing the queen as a garter of d4. So before he made that move, black's attacking that pawn three times and white is guarding it three times. So if black starts taking, it's just going to be safe. If, for instance, if white does plays bishop e2, and black takes the pawn, which is not the main move, and white takes back, then black can't take the pawn because it's guarded twice, and he would end up losing a piece. He can take, he can trade pawns to start with, but then he can't win anything after that. On the other hand, if white plays queen to c2, Black should calculate and say, gee, I've now got this pawn attack three times. I can play pawn takes, pawn takes, knight takes, knight takes, queen takes, and it looks like I might be winning that pawn. But then you have to look for other things. Like, for instance, could white throw a check in in the middle and win the piece at the end or in the middle? Or maybe he could throw a bishop checks in, or maybe his queen can take this bishop at the end. Well, clearly the queen can't take the bishop. Pawn takes, pawn takes, knight takes, knight takes, queen takes, queen takes, bishop is guarded by the rook, so that's not a problem. All right, what else could happen? Well, as we said, we could throw in a check. So pawn takes, pawn takes, there's no check yet. And now if black wants to try to win the pawn, he has to take with a knight. Clearly bishop checks, fails to just knight takes bishop. But what about a queen check? Queen check here hits this knight a second time. Can that win the knight? Well, if black plays something like bishop d7, the answer is probably yes. Then I could play queen takes d4. But suppose he just brings the knight back to c6. Then it's guarded by a pawn and a queen, and even if I play something like bishop to b5, he can always play bishop d7. He's got it guarded three times. Yeah, maybe I can attack the queen or something, but... It doesn't look like I'm getting back my pawn here. It doesn't look like white's getting back his pawn. So that doesn't seem to work. Now at some point, you've been playing slow now that you're out of your book. At some point you have to realize, okay, it doesn't look like white can get his pawn back. It doesn't look like this is a trap. It looks like I can just win that pawn on d4. If you get to that point in your thinking, you don't have to sit there and say, well, gee, he's probably analyzed this with the computer and I probably really can't take it, so I won't take it. That's crazy. You don't want to do that. You want to say, okay, he took three minutes on this move. He's out of his book. My safety table tells me I can win that pawn on d4. I just looked at all the checks, captures, and threats. I don't see any way that he can get the pawn back. And even if he does, I'm still even. I should just go after that pawn. I should try to make him prove that queen to c2 is okay. And maybe, maybe the reason why queen c2 isn't book is because it just loses that pawn on d4 and I'm just winning a pawn and I'm just winning the game. All right, let's see what senior citizen did here as black. This game was played many years ago. And let's see how much time he took. He plays bishop to d7. So he kind of either, and, and look, if you look at his clock, he had 43.31, and then he goes down to 42.10. Well, if we add the 45-second increment, that's roughly two minutes. 
So he took two minutes on this move and decided not to win the pawn. But that doesn't make sense because there's really no sequence that we could find where white is going to be able to save the pawn. So let's ask Stockfish 12 what the best move is. Let's move this up here. We'll hit the analysis button here on ICC. And Stockfish says, Dan, you were right and senior citizen was wrong, even though Dan's now a senior citizen too. And black should play pawn takes pawn and the evaluation of the position is just very close to minus one, meaning he's just winning a pawn basically for nothing. So yes, C takes D4 was the right move. Black may, may or may, we, we'll never know. I can't go back in time and ask him, but Black may or may not have figured that he could win that pawn, but then maybe he got spooked out of it for some reason. But that's the whole purpose of this video is we don't want you to get spooked out of what's happening when your opponent plays a non-book move. All right, so that's an amateur game. Let's look at a game at a higher level. Um, let me create a new board here. All right, so let's look at a game where I played international master Rick Costigan. Um, this was in the Philadelphia Invitational Championship Tournament. And I was white, Rich was black. I played e4, Rich played e5, I played knight f3, Rich played knight c6, I played bishop b5. I shouldn't call him Rich, I should call him Rick. Rich Pariseau, but Rick Costigan. Okay, so Rick plays a6, I'm in my book of course, bishop a4. He plays knight f6. Earlier in my career, I had been playing d4, but against the top players, that doesn't do very much. So I played main line. I played castles. Rick played rook e, bishop e7, main move of the closed variation. I played rook e1. And now Rick, I'm threatening bishop takes c6, and then knight takes e5, removing the guard and winning a pawn. So the normal way for black to play in the main line is to play b5, bishop b3, so the bishop can't take the knight, and the knight can continue to guard the pawn. But Rick played d6, which is the Steinitz doubly delayed, I think it's called. And I said to myself, hmm, that's rare. We could transpose back into the main line if Rick plays b5, but that may not happen, and we may be playing something independent here. So already black can play bishop to g4. So I have to make a decision. At this point, I'm not an expert on the Steinus doubly delayed, but my guess is that the two book moves are h3 and c3. And I have to figure out which one I want to play. And I figured if he plays bishop g4 now before my pawn gets on d4, I'll just play that line where I put the pawn on d3 and then play knight bd2, knight f1, knight g3 and hit the bishop that's on h5. So from that other line, I deduced that it's okay to play c3 here. So I played c3, and according to my notes, I took one minute on that move, and Rich, Rick did play bishop g4, and I took two and a half minutes to make sure my original plan made sense. So I played h3, and he played bishop h5. Now this is a well-known mistake for black if his pawn's on b5 and my bishop's on b3. And I figured it, it probably didn't make too much difference. So I continue with my plan of understanding that other line where I play d3, which is the book move if black had played b5 and bishop b3. So now black plays queen to d7. Now I'm really out of my book. Now this is certainly different, but, but my plan is still knight d2, knight f1, knight g3 to hit the bishop. And I think, okay, well, this there's no reason not to do that. The knight on c6 is pinned. And I don't have to worry as much about d4 later because of that. But he can always play b5, but that'll take me back into my book line. So I thought here for 14 minutes, because now I'm really saying this is not normal. And up to now, I'm kind of relying on something that's very similar to what I knew and comparing it. So here against Rick, I play knight bd2. And Rick surprises me with a move he probably prepared at home. He plays g5. He says, that's why I'm not castling. I'm going to throw the kitchen sink at your h3 pawn and open up your king. All right, so now I am really thinking, this is interesting. I am not panicked. I never panic. I just say, wow, this is cute. This is interesting. I wonder what I'm supposed to do against this. And how much time did I take on this move? On this move, I took 
four minutes. So I was saying, can I still go ahead with my idea here? Let's say a stockfish, what's happening here? Stockfish didn't exist at the time of this game. Stockfish says, yes, my move knight f1 is the number one move and I'm ahead by way more than a normal advantage. I'm ahead by about almost a pawn. So I play knight f1 and of course, Rick plays g4 and I can't let him open up my king like this. So I have to take and he takes with the bishop. And now I have a choice between playing knight to g3 first or playing d4. So I thought about this for a while. I thought for three minutes and I thought knight g3 was the more accurate way to play, but Stockfish says it's not. Stockfish says knight g3 is only the third best move. Now it's not even the third best move. So it says I have two moves to get a big advantage. Knight on one to h2 to hit the bishop, which I didn't think did anything because he would just play bishop h5, or play d4 right away. So if I had to do this game again, and I, an and I had a computer to analyze it with, I would analyze d4 here and get a big advantage. But of course, I'm not using a computer. We're not cheating during the game. And we didn't have good computers in those days anyway. So I played knight to g3. And here, Rick plays h5, which is Stockfish says is the best move and gives equality. And now my advantage is gone, but I can play d4. And I do play d4. And now Rick can play h4. Rick's actually taking a lot of time here too. He's used up 40 minutes by the time he plays h5. And here he plays h4. And again, the computer says if, if we play it correctly, it's going to be even. I play the only move I can, which is knight f5. I'm not worried that he's attacking it twice and I'm only guarding it once because I can blast open the center. I'd be glad if he gives up that white squared bishop for that knight. Rick now plays b5 to get out of the pin. I play bishop b3. Stockfish says it's a little bit better to play bishop c2. Bishop b3. Rick takes the pawn. He takes. And now Stockfish says I should play a4. I don't even know if I considered that move. But then again, computers play moves that you don't expect. So I just recapture the pawn. And Rick tries to blast me open with h3. Now Stockfish says I should play the weird move knight h6 to block the file. I, I take his bishop on e7. Stockfish says, oh, that's close to minus two here after he takes with the king. So Rick, unfortunately, he has three ways to take. L look how critical this is. If he takes with the queen, it's even. If he takes with the knight, he's winning. If he takes with the king, he's completely winning. So Rick has three ways to take back. Well, whenever someone takes like this, you can't take quickly. You have to figure out which one it is. And I'm sure Rick took his time on this move, but he picked it wrong. He picked the worst one. He took with the queen. Thank goodness for me. And now the computer says I should play e5 with equality. This is a very, very complicated position. We're both eating up a lot of time. I, on these two last two moves, I took 22 minutes. So here I played bishop d5, but that loses. All he has to do is cast the queen side. All right, Rick figures he has to save the, but castling queen side, of course, gives me the knight, but it wins the game for him, but it's complicated. So instead he guards the knight with the king and I play my best move, bishop g5, but it's still bad for me. And now Stockfish says h takes g2 wins for black. Instead, Rick plays the second best move, which is rook a g8. And I play the only move I can, bishop takes c6 check. King takes c6. And now I have to play e5, it's my only ch chance. And now Rick says, I'll give you all those pieces because I can mate you with the two rooks. And he plays pawn takes. Is that the best move? Uh, it's close. Computer says between king b6 and h takes g. So 
h takes g. I play bishop f6. It's my only move to keep me in the game. Here's Rick's idea. He plays bishop takes f3, letting me take the piece with check, which is a very rare thing that you would let someone take a piece with check while he's attacking your queen. But the problem is, when he gets out of check, I can't take the queen because rook h1 is checkmate. So after bishop f3, queen f3 check, you get this really rare kind of position, king b6, where his queen cannot be taken. Rook h1 is mate, and I need to stop the mate. So what should I do? Well, I have to take the rook. Too bad I can't take the queen. And now Rick plays queen h4, threatening mate again. What can I do to stop the mate? Well, I play the only move I can. Queen takes g2. And now Rick says, well, thanks for the bishop because I got your queen pinned. Queen takes. Let's see, was that the best move? Uh, Stockfish says it's close between taking the rook first or taking the bishop first. It may transpose. Queen takes on h8. Uh, I play... Crazy game, right? I uh, lost my place in the book here. Let's see, that was move 26. Queen h8, I play rook ad1, finally developing my rook. He takes the queen, I take back, and now we're in an endgame where black is slightly better, even though I have two rooks versus the queen. Rick tried to win for another 30 moves, which were mostly 1 20th as interesting as what the game was up to here. And I was able to easily hold the draw here against I am Rick Costigan. Okay, so today we've looked at what do you do when your opponent plays a move that takes you out of your book. Rick certainly did that in this game. We saw an amateur game where that happened and it wasn't reacted to as well. We saw, you know, sometimes you can play moves that you already know, even though you're out of your book. Sometimes you really, that's a really bad idea, but in any case, you got to really slow down. Okay, I hope you enjoyed today's video and I hope you learned something. Um, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button. If you have a comment, you can comment in the uh, places below or you can email me through my website, danheisman.com. Uh, you can check out my chess tip of the day on Twitter at Dan Heisman. And if you like the video, hit that like button. Thanks a lot. We'll see you next time. Bye.